So yeah, I, I appreciate uh, both Professor Nihar Shah and Joshua Tan joining us today. So I guess to, to get us started, do you mind just doing some quick intros and please use the mic for record, recording purposes? Um, hi, so uh, my name is uh, Nihar Shah. Uh, I'm a faculty in the machine learning department and the computer science department here at CMU. Um, and my work uh, focuses on improving peer review, so designing computational tools to improve peer review, running experiments to understand the various challenges and trade-offs uh, in peer review. Awesome. Hi, folks. I'm Josh. I am, I guess, technically now a postdoc at the University of Oxford, as well as a uh, fellow at Stanford's Digital Civil Society Lab. I am also the executive director of Medigov, which is a research collective that d builds standards and infrastructure for online governance, including but not limited to Web3 and blockchains. Um, I guess in the context of this discussion, I also helped found a, um, a open, well, not an open, just a peer review journal called Compositionality, and I'm also uh, an editor of a book series at Cambridge University Press, so I have a little bit of experience with the publishing side. Great, thank you guys. And uh, just for everyone's context, I'm Eugene Leventhal. I'm the head of operations and outreach at the Smart Contract Research Forum, uh, which is a grant funded organization dedicated to advancing research in the Web3 space. Uh, and we're in the process of actually structuring an, uh, an open peer review experiment for independent researchers in the Web3 space. And we want to make sure we are not reinventing the wheel and learning from a lot of brilliant folks who have done work in either running journals or just systematic research on it and just seeing how we can best learn to inform the experiment that we're going to be running. Uh, and if anyone wants to learn more about it, I'm happy to chat about it. But that experiment is definitely not the goal of today's discussion. Uh, and I'm much more excited to just generally chat and uh, get into some peer review and open peer review questions. Um, so yeah, I guess to kick it off, uh, Nihar, if you don't mind starting us with the very basic question of what do you see as peer review? What is peer review? Yeah, so um, peer review has been around for a few hundred years, although it's gained popularity quite recently in the past century or so. Um, and in peer review, researchers, they'll, they'll do research, they'll write a paper about it, and then they'll submit it to a venue, which could be a journal or a conference um, as of today. And the journal or the conference will assign the papers to a few other experts in, in this field of that paper. And the experts will then weigh in about the quality of the paper in terms of various aspects. And then the paper is either accepted to a conference or the journal, or sometimes, or often, it's declined. So this is broadly peer review, because your peers are reviewing your paper. Cool, and does that sound in line with the experience with the journal you're involved in? Uh, well, I guess to me, it's just a beautiful but very messy process where I have to email a lot of people, I manage a lot of editors, and just deal with a lot of noise in order to get a journal actually working and functioning and having sometimes to deal with very angry authors, yes. That to me is peer review. And I guess <laughs> for, a different side. Especially for folks who might be listening who have not been through the process itself, like how long can that take? How frustrating can it actually be to go through getting something reviewed? Oh gosh. Um, I think it probably depends on the venue and the discipline. Uh, in CS, I mean, um, uh, I guess New York could probably speak more to this, but like people are much used to much faster turnarounds because it's usually like kind of conference publication. Uh, in math, uh, you might be living, looking at like multiple years where something's sitting there, floating about, waiting for review, getting review, then going through corrections. It is deeply painful. Um, I can say that our journal does move pretty fast despite being a journal and not a conference. But yeah. I agree with what you said. So com computer science largely focuses on a conference model, which, is, which has fixed deadlines. Like you submit on April 5, you're, you're supposed to get a review on July 25, and then your final decisions will come out on April, August 2, for example. So it's pretty fast and fixed deadlines. And that's for the conferences that that's have for the, the more conferences, structure. yeah. And in general, peer review seems to just generally be split if you're either going through publication or through conference, uh, accepting in speech there. Yes, and conferences are also associated to accepted papers. Yeah. So in computer science, like in, or in most uh, um, disciplines other than computer science, journals form what are called a terminal venue for a paper, uh, for publishing it. Whereas in computer science, frequently conferences 
are the terminal venue. So mm -hmm. you submit to a computer science conference. If it gets accepted, this is it. Um, sometimes you submit to a journal as well, an extended version. But by and large, it's conferences. And is it fair to assume then in, in the math side more, it's leaning more towards journals if it has that kind of such open-ended and delayed structure, or not necessarily? Um, or do the conferences keep getting pushed? <laughs> so it's actually, it, it can be quite diverse, actually. Um, so uh, so I, I work in a field that's like kind of a cross between CS and math, um, uh, something called applied category theory. And it's, um, you know, you have like tracks where there's like symposia, where you like, you know, it's not necessarily for publication. And then there are conferences and people write up more like, let's say, um, uh, how do I say it? More concrete results or some of the more CSE results. And then they actually prepare other parts of it for publication where, you know, they get to put all their, all the mathematical work they've done, you know, into like 60 page tomes and then publish it into a journal. So they get to really sort of get every piece of the pie. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, uh, how do I say it? It's um, definitely on the more mathy side, it's just like traditionally journals, yes. Got it, cool. And so it'd be great to dive into what some of the current issues in, in peer review actually are. And we'll make sure to link to your presentation in the show notes for the video that we put up. Uh, but I know Nihar, you kind of have a, a great presentation overviewing some of the known bias problems uh, around peer review. So do you mind delving into that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, current peer review faces a few challenges. Um, one of the challenges is that of biases, biases with respect to the author identities. So there are various studies which have shown that if reviewers know the author's identity, then they can be biased. Uh, in particular, biased towards authors who are already famous or who are from better ranked institutions. There's also studies on gender biases where there are somewhat mixed results, um, but these biases do exist. And that's one challenge. Um, another challenge is that of fraud or dishonest behavior. And uh, there are various kinds of dishonest behaviors that have come to light. Um, then there are issues of uh, subjectivity where reviewers' personal preferences come in or, or cognitive biases, they play an important role in peer review, whereas they should not. Then there are issues of incentives. Um, what are good incentives for reviewing? Currently, there aren't really many incentives. Um, and then there are re issues related to publishing as well, um, where you know, many journals particularly, they are for-profit journals, and they put up papers behind paywalls and so on. So those are other issues as well. And any in your mind that you would want to add to that list in terms of your own experiences with it? Um, so I guess we, we had a, so the question is challenges in peer review, yeah. right? Um, so I guess for me, I guess being a little bit more in the weeds, it's like the hardest part is just finding good reviewers. And I'm sure like everybody encounters problems in academia, right? Um, in the questions of like sort of the institutional design of these things, which I guess were a little bit more abstract in this conversation here, um, like we had a long conversation um, when we were starting the journal around whether it should be open, single, double blind. Um, we ended up choosing um, kind of like single blind because we're very much like we're actually designed to be an archive overlay journal, which mm -hmm. is like a I don't know if it makes sense, but it's basically like people publish first on archive and then we just link directly to the archive rather than trying to host any of the sort of um, the journal, the articles ourselves. And obviously archive is, you know, everything's public. Um, but we did want to implement, you know, for authors that chose it, uh, they could decide to do double blind, essentially. So it was like the default is single blind and then they could choose to do double blind. And one thing is just like noticing the defaults is that like, even though we gave people the option, almost nobody chooses to do double blind, actually. Like, actually, I don't think hmm. in the history of, you know, we've been around for three years now, before, almost four, and like not a single person or author has, you know, asked to do double blind. Uh, so that's just like one kind of thing, or the importance of defaults in these kind of like institutions, where like oftentimes because these are, these defaults are built into the platforms, these like technical defaults built into the platforms are incredibly important in structuring behavior and like the evolution of these disciplines. Interesting. And are, are there any major uh, either publications or conferences that you're aware of that do have kind of full double blind in place? Yeah, um, lots of them. Like double blind is 
kind of de facto standard in machine learning conferences. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, some conferences have stricter conditions. For example, um, there are a few conferences in natural language processing and computer vision, which say which are double blind. And in addition, they say that starting from one month before the submission deadline till the end of the review process, you cannot submit your paper to archive or anywhere online. Mm -hmm. You cannot update it. You cannot advertise it on social media, et cetera. And there are a few other conferences which have completely banned it. So if you have mm -hmm. put up your paper on archive, you can't submit it here. Mm -hmm. um, so double blind is very common in, in computer science. Okay, interesting. And yeah, I want to start zooming into sort of some of the aspects of openness and what that means. But I guess similar kind of a you know basic leading question of what does the open portion of open peer review actually allude to and mean? Yeah. Um, so at least in in the literature I've read and the people I've spoken to, um, open peer review or open review is a highly overloaded term, and there are probably five or six different meanings depend on, depending on who you speak to. Uh, so maybe we could also disambiguate it and uh, kind of decide on what what we are talking about. Um, so one of them, which is popular in machine learning, um, is where all the submitted papers are available online. And all the reviews are also publicly available online. Okay. Um, so this is in computer science and machine learning. Uh, there's this platform called openreview.net, which is a very nice conference management system, which some conferences use. And kind of that's, that's usually used for this kind of open peer review. Then uh, there's, there's some other venues which uh, do what are also called signed reviews where in addition to the reviews being online, the name of the reviewer is also online. So it, it tells that you know, Josh reviewed this paper. Um, so that's, that's also sometimes called open peer review. Um, in addition, then there's, uh, um, there's, there's some which currently, and you, you folks might be more familiar with it, they're building review processes on the blockchain itself. Um, that sometimes I've heard is called open peer review. Uh, then there's one more which uh, is also called post-publication review, where if a paper is accepted, it's available on a website where people anywhere can comment, even after acceptance. That sometimes I've heard it being called open peer review. And then there's one more which uh, kind of says that, hey, let's not do the formal peer review process. All of the papers can just go online, and then people can comment on it. And we let the market forces drive the papers instead of a formal review process. And this, sometimes this is also called open review. Uh, any others? Uh, I can't really think of anything. Maybe just emphasizing that in like some of these blockchain contexts, it's a kind of pseudonymous peer review, right? where it's not a specific entity or an ORCID ID that's reviewing you. It's somebody on the internet that has like kind of like a bid. It's not quite a stable identity. It is relatively stable, but it's not linked to a real world identity yeah. that we can track necessarily. Right? Yeah, yeah, and I'll just quickly say for anyone who's just coming in, please feel free to come grab food. But um, it, it's an interesting one where it's sort of thinking then, what is kind of the, the minimum set of openness? Uh, what are the minimum set of open features that would qualify, at least for you two individually, for something to be open peer review? Uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested in, in what you think about that. Um, well, OK, I guess my generic res quick response is that I, it's, it's really, I think, not quite the right framing to say, like, what is the minimum? Because it's, like, it's very contextual to the specific field and institution that you are sort of like defining yourself in, right? Um, because like in my field, well, let's say, like, suppose I'm publishing in a relatively small research field, like everybody knows everybody. Um, maybe that's like a reason to do like more single blind um, and more open because everybody all kind of like tacitly knows. But maybe it's actually like, you know, for some people it's like the norms are, we need to be super sort of clear that it's like should be double blind and, um, yeah, just like the level of openness, I think, is like highly contingent on a lot of cultural things that depend on, you know, just like how the discipline itself and how these researchers work. 
Yeah, and so I guess quickly before passing it off to Nihar, I, 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 given that you're at this interesting intersection of math and CS, I'm guessing it's, it, 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 do you feel like it's more on the niche side in terms of a lot of people already know each other, or is it such a huge community that you easily can have folks jump in and, and kind of those other considerations? Right? Um, so it is relatively niche in that, um, well, it's, it's becoming one of those hype things that like a lot of people are coming in, so it's like expanding. But it's uh, like I would probably say I could like I would know at least by name every single person that could possibly review like a large section of these papers, right? Whether well, that that's absolutely not possible in machine learning, yeah. right? Um, and in that case, uh, I mean, there's arguments for and against peer review. I, I thought like one of the funniest anecdotes that we were having this conversation about whether to do like allow open peer review um, or some form of it, given all the different forms. And uh, somebody pointed out that you know, in their experience editing one of the journals, and they were reading a paper by this very famous author, and one of the arguments against, you know, was it like more openish, is that um, uh, you didn't want to bias people toward uh, sort of famous people. And it said, yes, this is indeed one of the you know, best arguments after reading this paper against open peer review because I really don't want to ruin this guy's reputation because I know who this person is now and this paper is utterly trash. So there's all sorts of like different kinds of incentives and things you wouldn't necessarily expect that you get out of peer review beyond just like the, the I guess the strategic uh, question around like giving people preferences that they shouldn't be given. That makes sense. And what about in the context of more CS and machine learning? Yeah, well, so I'm a part of the machine learning community and hence I'm slightly biased towards the meaning of open review. Um, so if you say open review, my mind immediately goes to the papers are all available online and the reviews are all online, but not the reviewer identities. Mm. Interesting. And so I guess on that note, one thing I've been thinking about more is, are there systems where you could set up a certain level of anonymity during the review process and then once everything's done, reviews are integrated, then sort of uh, disclose who is doing what in the process. Do you feel like that solves some of the concerns around the issues of like, oh, well, this is the biggest name in the industry. And like, if I you know, talk bad about them, I might have some blowback as a junior researcher or something like that. Do you think that would mitigate some of it? So some version of it is there in this open review platform that I said. So that does double blind reviewing. Uh, the author names are not visible during the review process. But as soon as the review process ends, the author names are visible. Yeah. Um, the reviewer names are not. Now, if you want to make the reviewer names also visible, still there is this challenge of incentives, right? So if I'm a junior reviewer and I want to criticize the paper of a really senior or famous person who maybe someday might be looking to hire me and so on, uh, even if my name is revealed at the end of the review process or maybe even two years later, I, I don't really want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I just like, I mean, we, what's the right way of saying this? We implemented a kind of system that is kind of like a little bit in between. So we didn't want to sort of force reviewers to implement, um, like to reveal themselves, but give them the option. But you also wanted to, what's the right, like, it, it is quite awkward sometimes to attach, especially if you're a junior, um, to attach your name to a review for a senior person. Um, especially if that's like not positive, uh, which obviously incentivizes more positivity, especially in these single review, single blind cases. Um, and but we also wanted like reviewing an article, like in giving constructive comments, is an incredibly valuable thing, right? Um, so we originally were implementing a system where we would essentially public acknowledge and thank reviewers, mm. uh, just like in a general pool, all people who have contributed to you know our journal uh, or this community. Uh, you get recognized somehow as participating, uh, but that's not associated to a single you know, article. And your, your name, I mean, it's, it's still opt-in in some sense. Uh, we did that for a while, and then, I'll be honest, it actually just became kind of a pain to implement, because mm -hmm. you had to get all these permissioning and yeah. like, but it's like, it's a potential kind of system that kind of, not quite you know, on one level exactly, but some tries to steer between. Yeah. yeah. And one thing that I think about a lot when I hear about some of the criticisms and dangers of having things open and the blowback and things like that, 
How much of that is a culture problem uh, of just, you know, some people are just okay with being super aggressive and mean in their review, and they're worried that if they open that up and everyone knows they were the mean person, that might have uh, issues for them, or, you know, for the junior person who wants to comment on someone uh, senior's uh, sort of information and work, uh, to at maybe approach that in a way that will not necessarily limit their hiring of like, hey, I'm just trying to make your work as strong as possible, and just making sure I got this correctly, and like, how much of it is, it, is an approach and culture problem? Problem versus do you see genuine concerns that no matter how well we adjust the incentives and the culture, we still just need to be concerned about uh, shielding identity to some capacity? Yeah, um, so I, I don't know of any studies that, that uh, actually uh, answer your question. Um, however, um, like there are some statistics that I think nature tried doing signing of reviews and I think around 1% of reviewers did that. Um, and there are other studies which also report very small numbers. Um, however, one point is that a lot of these peer review processes, uh, they don't just ask you to check, hey, is this paper correct? So if you had to state objective facts alone, like, hey, this theorem which you're trying to prove is wrong in step five, right? Uh, maybe that is still OK. However, in a vast majority of cases, the reviewer is also asked subjective questions. Like, is the proposal novel? Do you think it will have impact? And so on. And now if I have to comment on that, it's hard for me to just say, oh, maybe I was trying to clarify, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so maybe if you are in a model where you're just asking, hey, is this correct or not? Tell us only the objective parts. Maybe people will be more willing to sign their names. Interesting, yeah. And I guess uh, related to that, I wanted to zoom in also on the question of incentives, uh, both in, in terms of review more broadly. Uh, and it, it's an interesting one to think, as you mentioned, sort of the current model is very much, uh, at least in the States, taxpayer subsidized. A lot of it gets still put behind paywalls. Uh, and peer reviewers or academics are told that like, hey, it's part of your service as an academic. You must do this uh, and sort of donate your time to do this thing. And without mentioning any names, I've gotten some personal feedback in talking to academics, especially on the tenured level, where it's like, well, I already got where I'm going. Like, I, I don't need to play that game unless there's a, a paper that I'm particularly interested in. There is a tension around finding time to do it because you're not incentivized. On the flip side, if you pay per review, just like similar pay per comment, that could also devolve the quality of the work. So what are your personal views on the, the pros versus cons when it comes to actually paying reviewers to do reviews? Um, so you mentioned paywalling and then this one. So I think paywalling is also an important point which we can discuss later. Uh, but regarding uh, paying reviews, so uh, there have been a few studies about these incentives. Um, first of all, there are a lot of opinion pieces in the literature which say that, hey, we need to develop a better incentive system. Let's give points to reviewers or badges or money, et cetera, to reviewers. So there are a lot of opinions of this form. It has not been clear how to actually execute it in a manner that works well. Um, so for example, a few communities have tried out things like points for reviewing. If you review a paper, you get three points or some number of points. And then there's a leaderboard. Yeah. Um, for those kinds of systems, there have been some studies about what happens in practice. So in practice, there are a few people um, who you really want them to review, but these points are not really incentivizing them because they don't matter so much, so they don't care. On the other hand, there are other people who really want these points. So they'll really try to review lots and lots and lots of papers, may not do a very good job because their goal is just to get these points. It's if you put this metric, people will start chasing this metric. Um, and similarly, potentially for money. So it's a challenge of how to incentivize people. There are strong incentives internally for people that, hey, we want to make science better. We want to understand these papers in my area, and so on. And then you also want to couple them a little bit with more materialistic. But you don't want to uh, dissolve the non-materialistic incentives. So it's not really clear how to do that. And uh, I don't think we have been successful in doing that. 
Um, there have been, I, I was recently reading a very nice paper by Squazoni et al. I think this was a couple, from a couple of years back, where they did a nice experiment. So they wanted to study various incentives uh, for reviewing, and they created a nice game which the subjects of the experiment would play. And this game models various effects, uh, like giving points, or like a fixed payment versus a, a payment or points related to some something in the review versus no incentives at all. And then they measured the behavior of people. And uh, it turned out what they found is that no explicit incentives performed the best. And the surveys of the participants found that this was just the, the intrinsic motivation mm. and trust that was driving them. Mm. And that performed the best. So yeah, this is a pretty wide open problem, which I, I don't think we know how to handle. Yeah. Josh, what do you think? I guess I would say that um, I would point out like this kind of question is um, like an instance of a much larger problem around the sort of like this crowning out effect and design of like financial versus let's say more intrinsic and cultural incentives. Um, and as part of my, I guess you could call it math research, but I mean, anyways, uh, a lot of the research I do kind of involves online communities that ex have exactly this problem um, where I literally, like, I'm working with a community of, like, let's say, art, of artists in this case, who have a, like, they have a platform that people participate in for free in a kind of like a typical peer production Web two kind of mode, uh, and they participate and they communicate with each other and they have like an amazing sort of really great community, but uh, this community of artists uh, kind of very it was kind of like a very funny situation. They were participating. They were one of the early innovators in the kind of the NFT sort of ecosystem. And magically, they just ended up with around, I don't know, by some counts, like $50 million in the bank. Mm -hmm. And now they just like this community of people have to deal with all this money. Mm -hmm. and it's like, what do they do with it? It's like, are they going to pay themselves? And their, their, their fear, and they're very, very right about this, is that if they just start paying themselves or paying people to use the platform, it's going to completely blow everything apart. Yeah. Because the incentives that you know, exist within that platform cannot survive that kind of like monetary flow. The market you know, incentives will just blow everything apart. Uh, and you actually see this kind of system being repeated over and over again in, let's say, crypto and Web3, where you know, there happens to be a lot of money, and then it's being injected into these systems, and it kind of blows them apart, or certainly like, puts a lot of strain on them. So I don't think anybody's expecting like, that level of volume of money to be going into like, you know, open peer review, but I think it's like, I, I, I try to think about like how do I modularize these kinds of incentives? How do I create a firewall around a certain kind of, let's say, institutional sort of design, where there's like you know intrinsic motivations, these can come into play, while allowing for the fact that you know people who do peer review, uh, especially like you know like grad students, are not being well compensated for the time, but it's very valuable. So how can we make sure these people have like a living, right? How can we support them? in some sort of way, and that's where like financial incentives obviously make a lot of sense, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's still a hard problem, I, but I would sort of like, maybe my answer to this is like how, really sort of focusing on how to sort of design modular incentive systems, uh, and modularity in, in these cases can sometimes, but not always, be enforced by, you know, these like technological systems that peer review sort of occurs in. Absolutely, and I know that's sort of part of what you were both just speaking about is kind of what scares me about the idea of like people who talk about the intersection of tokenization and peer review. If it's, if it's a publicly listed tradable coin that people are just gonna wanna hodl, there's gonna be all kinds of weird things that happen around it that will not help the system. But I wonder if even stepping away from that or even stepping away from the pure financial aspect of incentivization, uh, are there any things in your mind that can be done to tap some of that intrinsic motivation, whether it's more reputational systems or uh, uh, thinking through, especially on an interdisciplinary aspect, um, and just how certain papers, like in the Web3 domain, where you might need an economist and a computer scientist and a behavioral person, and just people coming in from different disciplines, which is not as traditionally done. Uh, have you seen or, or thought about any models of how to get people incentivized to do more peer review without having to add uh, the complexities of financial incentivization? Um, there are some approaches that have been taken. Um, uh, for example, 
uh, there's this new journal in machine learning called the Transactions and Machine Learning Research. Mm. And uh, what this is that if you do a really good job at reviewing, then we have a, a, a separate section on our website which is some highlighted papers. And there we will highlight a paper that was authored by you. Mm. So what this kind of gets at is that you know, researchers, they love their own work and they want their work to be publicized and, and everyone to read it, right? which, which is not kind of natural. And uh, they're looking to use that and, and uh, to incentivize good review. Now that journal has just started as of last month, so we'll wait and see how that works. Um, then there are some other conferences which give some sort of reviewing awards um, that if you do a very good review, you'll get some sort of a best reviewer award. So the top certain percent of best reviewers will get awards. Unclear how much of that has worked um, because first it's not really clear how much importance say potential employers are giving to such things on the resume. Yeah. And second, it's also not clear how good is this judgment quality about how good a review is. Like reviewing the reviews also has a lot of noise and other issues that exist in reviewing the papers. So if you really want to incentivize that, maybe we should also think about how to better review the reviews. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say I, I really love that first example. Um, that sounds actually, uh, how do I say it? Um, a lot of the kind of like, okay, so the quant qualitative social science part of this is like there's a like a large institute literature on that studies the design of institutions, especially within like economics and political science. Uh, for example, like Eleanor Ostrom and sort of the Ostrom workshops does a lot of this kind of research on like how communities govern themselves. And in a lot of cases, I think the, the more successful ones do try to do exactly this, where they like design or build in the incentives, like very kind of like closely to the like the architecture or the operations of the whatever the, the, the thing that's being governed, right? So this idea where I'm gonna give you a reward, which is you know, directly in my journal, which is like attached to the publication process and it's like valued in those terms, means it's like the value of that is not translatable, right? It's not like money where I can just like take it out and spend it on, I don't know, like food or stuff like that. Uh, which, I mean, problematic if you are starving, but also really good from, you know, not wanting incentives to invade uh, from other systems, right? That's, I just really love the experiment. I'm hoping this journal works out. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see. And that also made me wonder, as you were saying, kind of the, the question of who can be reviewing the reviewers and whatnot, and just wondering of uh, right, a, sort of another bucket of openness that some people think of as open participation, that anyone can be a reviewer and not just the select uh, group of folks that were hand selected. So uh, I guess first part of the question is, what are your thoughts on this kind of more crowdsourced peer review? Uh, and do you see it as a augmentation to first you have the curated list of peer reviewers there that's the bare minimum of it and then we can either for reviewing the reviewers or just adding another layer of review we can crowdsource uh, or is it better to just experiment purely with let's just open it to the masses and see how that goes so yeah, it would be interesting in what y'all think about that one yeah so um, uh, so many communities have tried to open up the reviewing. For example, this openreview.net platform, which I mentioned in machine learning, anyone can go and comment um, on, on that. Um, and there hasn't been much outside the traditionally chosen reviewers. Um, so there, there's a question of how do you incentivize more participation from the masses who are not assigned to review. Second, um, if you, let's say, don't do the traditional one and just open it up and say, hey, let the market forces drive it. Um, one, we need people to come in and do it. But second, there can also be some biases. For example, people might just read the papers from famous authors. And if you're not really famous, maybe no one will pay attention. So then there's a question of how to address that. A third is if you open it to the masses, you have to be careful, like it, it shouldn't turn into a Twitter. Um, so you, know, you, you do need, like, so first, if, if let's say it's completely anonymous, um, it's unclear how, like, how 
clearly you might think the reviewer has read this paper, etc. How much the reviewer has a background to understand it and so on. Um, whereas the way we traditionally do the reviews, at least the reviews are re reviewers are selected so that we hope they have expertise and background in these reviews. Um, lastly, I also have I've heard this somewhere that wherever people can make anonymous comments, um, some people are also trying to game the system. Like, if you have your paper online, you log in anonymously and say, oh, this is such a wonderful paper, in order to try to influence the real reviewers. So yeah. there, are, there are these challenges and trade-offs. But again, I, I think the current system that Open Review is following is kind of in a nice trade-off where you do have your traditionally assigned reviewers, and then it's also open for others to comment if they, if they want. Yeah. Yeah, I also would be very interested in the experiment of what is a tweet your review in 280 characters or less, what, what the quality of that would look like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I, I, I guess I'm, I would say I'm highly sympathetic to a lot of the concerns that Yarch has raised. Um, with the addition that I guess just like maybe pulling it back a bit, um, you see in a lot of these technological systems, um, like kind of this lean toward what I think broadly is like market logic. You know, this idea of like the more open, the more sort of like permissionless, the more sort of interaction you, you sort of enable, the better. Uh, but that leads to lots of certain kind of like negative externalities, right? You know, people talk about surveillance capitalism and like legal circles. Um, but, and I, I guess like, in our sort of culture today, like this kind of market logic, and I'm using using this word in a kind of like a bad way, I think too, meaning to mean too much. But a question that I have is just like, how do we facilitate, you know, maybe in some cases this will work, right? You know, in like test cases in these communities. Um, but like the thing about market logic and is the fact that it scales so well because it's so open and permissionless, right? And it has this effect of like, even if you and I like say, clearly there are all these problems with this system, but suppose somebody like magically puts up a token and it gets incentivized and it just like starts taking over because it scales. Mm. And you get these like non-optimal outcomes just because like something like, you know, you have these like massive incentive systems built somewhere else that just like get injected here. So like my, part of my question is not just like, you know, are these things a good idea? But like, how do we facilitate more like local kinds of development, and how do we like fire, firewall that to some extent from like the introduction of large pots of money from elsewhere um, is like the traditional way I think about it. Yeah, you know, just reframing that also around just some Web three aspects of uh, people think of just oh, open up your governance to a community and things will magically work well, and then it's like no, things just got really messy, and the people with the most money and influence drive things in a certain direction and can create all kinds of other elements of complexity around that. Um, but I do want to just ask one more question before opening it up for for questions from uh, anyone who's attending here with us, and hopefully turn it into more of a group discussion from here. But uh, I was wondering on the. Um, on the question of what your views are on the importance of modularizing peer review and the fact that especially when you get into industries that are inherently involved disciplines from different domains, you might only have three people who have the appropriate PhD plus level official education uh, in the world who can like say that like, yes, I am f officially educated in CS and psychology and economics and whatever else. So. Have you heard any discussions, or do you think it's a good idea to try to modularize peer review in that sense of being able to split up a paper and decide of like, well, here's the technical component, and we need a different set of people to review that, as opposed to this, which is much more qualitative in social science and might need a very different peer reviewer? Um, if you have heard of this, please talk about it. Yeah, um, Otherwise, I would have to make something up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, like, so kind of you're thinking about interdisciplinary work, right? And it's kind of implicitly done frequently where editors, they'll see a paper on machine learning for biology, and they'll try to get a, one reviewer from machine learning and one reviewer from biology. Ideally, what you want is somebody who has expertise in both machine learning and biology, and you may, not, may or may not have that person. And these kinds of issues are discussed in a lot of literature. Um, the, the disadvantages that interdisciplinary research faces 
um, in today's peer review system. So if you get, let's say, three reviewers who are in machine learning and biology, great, you're done. Suppose you don't. Suppose you get, let's say, two people in machine learning and one person in biology. Then there are problems which happen in the current peer review system. Um, one problem is that very frequently what happens is that each reviewer wants this paper to be the top as compared to other papers in their own field. And people have studied this issue. So now this interdisciplinary paper will have to have the best machine learning and the best biology, which is uh, like you should cut some slack for this interdisciplinary paper. Then there are these other issues, like for example, this biology reviewer is the only reviewer in biology here. And so now they have a veto power over the biology part. If they say, hey, this is not good, then this paper is dead. And there are various other such issues with interdisciplinary papers that have been discussed at length in the literature. So if you get so many reviewers with expertise across, then great. If you don't, then it gets this modularized, and that creates disadvantages mm -hmm. for interdisciplinary papers. Yeah, well, we just, uh, I guess we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but our approach, uh, because uh, I, my field is like relatively interdisciplinary, it's just we just started our own journal, right? Which is why, I, why we started this own journal, because it was quite hard to get over this hump of try to be publishing in these conferences, these conferences, and it's just like, it doesn't quite fit in either. It's hard getting reviewers. Um, yeah, and honestly, like, that might honestly be a more efficient solution, just to encourage people to start more journals, but in a way that makes them still like searchable. For example, like doing an archive overlay, um, while uh, without, as opposed to sort of modularizing the peer review process itself. Um, that said, I do find it interesting, but I would suspect uh, thinking about like modular design and other examples, like in engineering, um, you know, it's like it requires like to have effective modularization of expertise in this case, in these kinds of cases, usually requires quite a bit of schematization, right? You want to like, or formalization of like what is actually in with the object itself. Um, I guess like you would expect that just to be like the sections of the paper. There's a section that's biology, there's a section that's, you know, CS. But in practice, that's almost never the case, right? There's like always some sort of interconnection. One depends on understanding the results of the other. And obviously like understanding the whole impact requires how they interact. And that's, that's why they're interdisciplinary papers because there's a non-trivial, uh, almost non-modularizable sort of connection between these two that requires that examination, right? At least yeah. that's the, those are the interdisciplinary papers I find interesting. Yeah, that also makes me wonder just the whether or not it would be helpful in getting reviewers collaborating on their reviews, especially if there's that lack of knowing all of the disciplines. Uh, but I did promise to turn over to audience questions instead of just me constantly peppering with more questions. So yeah, if anyone does have any kind of questions or thoughts that you all uh, want to hear us chat about, please let us know. Uh, otherwise, I will keep driving with questions. But I, I'd love to make this more into a, a group discussion, especially because I do think there's a number of grad students in the office, in the office, in the audience, uh, who might have already been asked to like, hey, officially I'm the one tasked with peer review. Now it's your problem, and uh, dealing with certain other elements of the realities of peer review. So, yeah, just wondering uh, if anyone here has cues. Please. So, I don't know how to phrase this elegantly in a question, but how would you? the merits of closed versus open review in terms of more established reviewers like they have a lot better expertise but might be more fixed in their way of thinking about things versus younger or fresher reviewers uh, often have a lot less expertise and relative knowledge but might be more open to kind of radical ideas. Yeah, and just to repeat the question for the recording, kind of uh, comparing some of the, the merits of open and closed, especially when it comes to the difference uh, in experience level of the individual, of someone who's done a ton, been deep in the industry, versus kind of someone who might be more open-minded, but more at the early stage of their career and less uh, have done less peer review so far, if that captured it at least somewhat correctly. Yeah. Cool. Um, I don't know how to speak it from the perspective of open versus closed, but I do feel like in these situations, I, I mean, I personally always prefer like the younger one, um, but in a lot of cases, like the fact that there's an editor, you know, implies that there is this like secondary, more senior perspective that often acts as a check on, you know, whatever, like, you know, can provide a supplementary sort of opinion or voice. And like in practice, for example, um, what we often do is like, there's like multiple checks where 
there's a reviewer that sends in uh, a couple of reviewers, and then like, you know, if the editor thinks this isn't quite, you know, this just makes sense, like I'm going to call somebody else in the editorial board to get like a really quick opinion, and then pre-publication, you know, it actually goes out to the entire editorial board, and somebody's, you know, everybody sort of has to take a look at this and like, does this pass the sniff test? Because they're experts and they have like very evolved, I guess, sniff tests. Um, and that seems to work out actually fairly well for us. Yeah, um, in the machine learning community, because there's such a huge volume of papers, that a large fraction, maybe about 50% of the reviewers are more junior, they're PhD students. Um, and therefore, it kind of naturally happens that each paper gets a mix of senior and junior reviewers. Um, so, for example, in, in this year in the AAAI conference, every paper had two senior reviewers and two junior reviewers. Um, so, like, I, I agree with what Josh said, that at least in the context of machine learning, for example, it's less of open versus closed, and it's already this mixed thing. Um, now, that said, so open review, as I said, is, is open, right? So, even during the review process and after, people can go and comment, which, 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 like even if the original reviews were senior or maybe junior, there is space for further commenting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Anyone else have any other questions they'd want to ask? Please. I guess I was wondering about any sort of attempts to automate, you know, not the peer review itself, but maybe filtering out the papers that are just, you know, so far from possibly being accepted? Yeah, so the question yeah. was around the possibility of automating uh, some of the peer review process to at least filter out the noise if not doing the peer review itself. Yeah, there have been various attempts. So first, there have been a few attempts to completely automate the peer review process itself, and those have not really worked well. Okay, so there are systems online which claim that they'll do the review and so on, and you submit a paper and you get some random review which has been overfit to their training data. Um, now, that said, there are other systems which look at specific parts of the paper. For example, like the most basics one, basic ones are plagiarism checks and formatting of the papers. Then, moreover, there are slightly more advanced systems which look at other parts of the paper. For example, in, in many communities, you have a very standard format of a paper in which you write your research question, hypotheses, your methods, and your results, right? And there, these automated systems check if everything's okay, if you have reported the effect sizes properly, and things of that sort. So yes, there are systems to do some sort of checks, um, but there have been attempts to do full peer review, unsuccessful. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have much to comment on this, but I guess in my experience, the ones that are clearly bad are relatively easy to check and not that expensive to just remove from an experienced editor. It's like usually very obvious this is kind of crankish and will be desk rejected. Yeah. Just, just to add on, that said, like, as, as you might know, there are a lot of parts of the peer review process in which automated methods are used to ease the load on humans. Like, for example, assigning reviewers to papers and so on. So there are other parts where it is useful. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah I, I would be interested in seeing some of the results of the fully automated ones and just seeing how wonky some of the suggestions were there. But that's, a, that's for another time. But yeah, anyone else have any, any other particular questions on their mind? Yeah, so the question was specifically around, uh, I, I guess, some of the incentives of someone's kind of writing a paper or reviewing a paper in the same domain uh, around some of the incentive challenges around wanting to uh, potentially harm another paper to make your paper look better relatively. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of uh, literature on, on that. Uh, first, there are cognitive biases which may or may not be conscious. Um, so these are confirmation biases which Let's say I believe that tea is really good for health, right? And, and maybe I've worked on it, and my past experience shows that in a certain setting. And now if there is a paper which comes along which says that tea is not good for health, 
I'll be far more against it as compared to if my previous research had shown that tea is good for health. And people have done really nice controlled experiments to quantify these issues. So this is one kind of issue. Uh, another kind of issue is what's often called torpedo reviewing, where uh, let's say you don't like some other work, maybe because you don't like that area, or maybe because you know that's a competing paper for your work. What you do is you try to get assigned that paper for review, and then you can you go and reject that. So that's another kind. A third kind that's observed in journals is that some people might try to delay competing papers that they are reviewing so that their paper comes out first. Um, so that's a third issue. And uh, now, how to address this? Um, I haven't seen any uh, standard recipe to address this. Um, there are a few things that, that people do, for example, that editors try to make sure this doesn't happen. They'll ask for conflicts of interest in much more detail, et cetera. Uh, second thing is spreading awareness, especially for the subconscious bias kind of things. Third is uh, for these kinds of things like torpedo reviewing and other kinds of misbehavior, there are some ways that conferences use to, to handle that as well. Uh, but there's no kind of standard overarching recipe that I have seen to address this issue that you mentioned. Interesting. Yeah, I don't really have that much to add except just having good editors and editors that pay attention. And I know this is gonna sound really kind of stupid, but just having like support staff for editors because uh, we talk about peer review, but editing a journal is also like mostly a volunteer process uh, unless you're like working for nature or something. Uh, and giving people, and usually like professors, uh, the time to actually do a good job editing and pay attention and keep track of who's doing what and actually like bother filling out conflict of interest forms, uh, that can be a big deal. Um, and just having a little bit of extra funding to have like support personnel automate and like just take care of certain tasks, that can be a big help there, honestly. It's like, a lot, like some, sometimes very small things can make a big difference. Yeah, going back to a previous question, I wonder, especially for the conflicts of interest checking and some of those aspects, is uh, are there some AI tools that might be able to help and automate some of that detection that someone forgot to fill out a form and is able to catch that to, to make sure if you know I'm reviewing your paper and we're in the same domain and I keep delaying it, it flags that like, hey, you have a paper in the same conference, you might have other incentives around it or, or something to that effect. Yeah, any yeah, please. I, I'm curious, like, if you talk about the year, so, but, but what is your estimate of? You know, by how much could we reduce the number of submissions uh, you know, if authors kind of do a good job of, of self-standing? Because based on my experience, like, most of the work, like, a, a, large, like, a big fraction of the work is actually just self-standard and submitted out of just pursuing some random chance. Interesting. That's an interesting question. The idea of uh, can can there be more author self-selection, and I guess as partially raising the bar of the quality of submissions. Uh, yeah, and I wonder if that would have to be like collectively agreed upon of what is the bar amongst the authors. Um, but I, I also feel like that goes back to the incentive question of what would be the incentive for that. But uh, did I capture the question correctly, Clea? I wonder what you guys think about that. Yeah, so um, for like one kind of incentive is the reputation, right? If let's say you submit a bad paper and that bad paper is up online with a review that says, hey, this is a terrible paper and your name is up there, hopefully this will disincentivize authors to submit such a paper. Well, it turns out that some conferences on open review, they have this system where the submitted papers are online and your name is online and all the reviews are online. And if it's a terrible paper, you'll have a review that says this is terrible and your name will be on it. Unclear how well that is working for incentives. When this open review platform was launched initially uh, nine years back, uh, they had done a survey uh, of conference participants and there, there was a strong feeling that yes, this will incentivize authors to self-select, etc. Unclear how well that has worked. Um, there's also some literature on, again, using these points and these kinds of things where if you review, you get some points and then you can use these points to submit. And if you don't have points, you can't submit. So hence you can't submit too much and things like that. Um, again, unclear how well that, that 
works. Um, these points thing, I, I don't, I haven't seen them working very well yet. Yeah, I also feel like that gets to some complex culture questions around review and whatnot, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, that's a really interesting proposal. I suspect what might happen though is you're very likely not gonna prevent like, let's say like all the cranks from sending stuff in. Instead, what you might actually end up happening is, let's say discouraging, let's say people who have, I don't know, like certain kinds of like students or uh, early career individuals who might have, I don't know, like outsiders, what was it, outsider syndrome? Uh, what's the right word for this? Um, imposter syndrome, right? Um, or people who are just generally speaking, like not so inclined to participate in this, like these highly, highly super competitive systems. Um, I don't know what's the right way of saying, like certain minority groups, for example. Uh, I, I'm not sure, like clearly we would need to run experiments, but I, I, I suspect that might be a possible outcome actually of this. Yeah, and I also wonder with that kind of idea, if sort of a, set, uh, a standard is set and I'm someone who passed that bar, is that standard per paper or per my reputation? And does that enable me to like, once I've cleared it and I got a few papers in, well now I can just coast and I don't need to do as hard work because I already cleared the, sort of the, the basic minimum threshold. Were you thinking of like any particular aspects of that or more just uh, more broadly on it? Maybe the problem is in that you put too much emphasis on publication. Like, you know, people do chase, you know, X in newspapers. Yeah. If there's no such incentive, then people wouldn't be overloading the idea of the review. Yeah, and that uh, sort of the, the follow-up comment was sort of a potentially decoupling some of the aspects of the review and where it's headed, uh, or at least that was my interpretation of it, because I know that was a question we didn't get to yet, so I'll just use this as a, as a prompt for that. But sort of, do you think that that sort of decoupling, and I know from an openness perspective that is another potential tenant of openness, is uh, what happens when a separate independent party conducts review and that can be fed into various publication venues if people choose to go, uh, and would having a separate body responsible for open peer review, or just finding various ways of decoupling peer review in the publication venue, would that help or hurt uh, in terms of the quality of both the review and the final work? Yeah, or maybe just accept 1%, instead of 20%, maybe just accept 1% of papers. Yeah. In this case, you kind of, unless you do something groundbreaking, you don't even hope for being accepted. I'm excited to see your future journal where it's like 0.01% <laughs> of papers accepted. <laughs> Again, this 1% unclear, right? Like if, if the review process is still as noisy, then you know if you get that 1%, it's like winning a lottery, right? So you really might want to submit because because of the random reviews, maybe you'll get the, into that 1% and now you've got your dream job and so on. So um, unclear, maybe will it lead to more problems, less problems? Um, I somehow think this other approach of uh, saying that will review your paper for correctness and then some very basic checks about relevance, etc. So this is something followed by this transaction on machine learning research, plus one, etc. I think that's a nice approach. It removes a lot of subjectivity in the review process. You're not really trying to judge if this paper will have great impact and so on. Right? You're just trying to make sure it's correct. That's the first and foremost thing. And then some basic checks on the other part. I think that's very good. And in that case now, if a paper is correct and reasonable, then you know, it'll get accepted and published. And if it's wrong, let's say, then it'll get, hopefully it'll get rejected, which is also an outcome that you'd want. Right? I think I, I find that as a nice model. Um, in terms of the question that you asked about feeding it to the publication venues, I think you're, you're thinking of the other publication venues as Maybe, like, tell me, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but the other publication venues as how it currently is where, you know, there are some publication venues which are very highly regarded and so on. Um, is, is that how you're thinking? That was part, in terms of the decoupling aspect? Yeah. I mean, that was part of it. I guess in my mind, it's also, especially from the perspective of the experiment that we're trying to run where it's supporting independent researchers, right? Your average independent researcher, and so much of Web3 has been built by independents and not, not folks in academia per se, um, 
they don't have publication venues. They don't have conferences to apply to. So uh, a lot of things that get pushed into production in the Web3 space should have had review, should have had auditing, should have had more oversight, but they don't. So it's more of um, the very selfish element would be sort of a, what value can providing a peer review to folks who are not currently playing the publication game uh, kind of add value? Uh, or what is the form of value that can be added there? But I think another dimension of it is um, right, I'm guessing the nature is the IEEEs, the massive organizations. There's a, I would love to see like the social network graph of the editors and the people who are at that level and the tenured professors and right, how much of that does end up being like, hey, we're buddies, so I'm gonna ask you to do some stuff. And how much is it a system that unintentionally keeps feeding itself at the top and doesn't actually do a good job letting new entrants into it? And would decoupling publication and review potentially mitigate that kind of concern if, but again, all this is predicated on a lot of ifs, but like if it's structured in a way that is much wider reaching, and I haven't thought through the specifics of what that could look like, but just in general of uh, with setting it aside, provide more room for clarity. So yeah. I'm still trying to understand the decoupling. So paper is peer reviewed. Yeah. And now after the review, let's say reviewers say, reviewer say, hey, this <clears throat> paper is good. Then what do you do with it? So at that point, it sort of triggers the next stage of figuring out the appropriate conferences that are currently looking for uh, speakers to present. Exactly, yeah. So it becomes more of a match algorithm. So then when you say appropriate conferences, you mean by topic? Correct. Not necessarily by, let's say, the ranking of a conference, et cetera. So yeah, that gets into the inherent complexity of this idea is how do you weight it appropriately and things like that, but at the very least by topic. Yeah, yeah. So I think like, um, again, I'll come back to a point which I said earlier, which is, you know, if you have review processes like a few journals do, which is you're looking at correctness uh, primarily, right? And that's the focus. And then some basic other checks. Um, let's say hypothetically all conferences start doing that, right? So in that case, conferences don't necessarily have a ranking as such because they're not looking for novelty and so on. Because these are already subjective and so on. Uh, in that case, the researchers themselves can see that the conference which they find are most appropriate in terms of topic, and there you have your peer review process which looks at, let's say, the correctness primarily. And if it's correct, you're welcome to come and present. Um, how does that sound? I mean, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I would just love to see more experimentation in that direction because I don't feel like we have good data to make uh, educated comparisons across these. And especially whenever there's any kind of incentivization mixed with reputational models upon which people's careers are dependent, there's just such an inter uh, interesting intermingling of factors that can swing people one way or another. Yeah, I agree. I think the current setup is that the, if you have a paper in the conference, right, they judge you on novelty, impact, et cetera, which are extremely noisy, extremely subjective. And now if you have a paper in the NeurIPS conference, you know, it's supposed to be some great thing, whereas it went through a highly noisy process. So you, it's actually not so much. Um, and now the papers get counted in the CVs and all of these problems happen. Uh, maybe like a, a key problem is to reduce the amount of subjectivity by changing the criteria that we are looking mm -hmm. at, whether it's coupled or decoupled or in any way. Currently, if you go to this NeurIPS conference, ICML conference, there is far less checking of whether the paper is rigorous, it's correct. And, and you see the reviews, they're a lot more subjective. Hey, this is not really interesting. It, that's the focus of the review. You didn't check for correctness. Uh, maybe I think, in any model, we should flip that. And the primary thing would be, hey, first check if this is right or wrong, and then do the other things. Yeah, yeah. it's also interesting to think of how you can open up the process of getting feedback of the variables that should be experimented on, and actually run a series of open experiments, produce all of your data so that researchers can explore and actually compare, and keep doing sort of a series of sort of multi-year targeted experimentation of how to, uh, to improve peer review. Um, yeah, you want to oh, I mean, I, I guess I would just say that uh, this kind of decoupling, I, I don't know, but I kind of suspect that it might not give to, it might not change like the incentives, like the basic incentive structure in like, let's say entrenched institutions like academia, which I guess we're all like sitting in within right now. Uh, but if you were to start 
on in these like more, let's say, like citizen science or sort of independent researcher kinds of uh, settings, like Web3, right? Uh, though obviously, like academia is still present there as well. Um, that might be a more reasonable place where you could expect, okay, having this, like this kind of decoupling and sort of, um, uh, let's say, like a protocol-based, uh, let's say, peer review process that then couples to a set of publications that are outside of that. That could like potentially work. Slash would be certainly an interesting experiment. Um, I would just like caution that clearly, like independent research also have their own incentives around like legitimacy and uh, attention and obviously like being paid. Yeah. Um, so it's not like a clean slate, if that makes any sense. Um, it's cleaner compared to like you know having to do with like giant institutions like CMU or just like like Nature. Right? Yeah. Absolutely, and it also it's so uh, domain specific to say governance. Uh, I feel like that's an that's an aspect of Web three that has just been openly experimented with, and then copy pasted, and then like minor tweaks, and it's very sort of independent driven. Whereas, say, uh, zero knowledge proofs and core cryptographic primitives still very academic driven, and I, I'm unaware of any actual like I know Plonk, which is a major uh, platform, stemmed from Ariel Gabazon's PhD work, and then he was a postdoc advancing it, and then he jumped into industry to build it. So it's also an unfair to to paint the entire Web three industry with a single brush as well. Yeah, it's, it's, I'll just add that it's, it's interesting to think about like the incentives around industry research. It's actually something like, I don't know if you have, you've actually done research on this, but like the um, like the incentives for how uh, like large corporations conduct research are clearly different from like you know academia, which is already like quite decentralized in a lot of ways, right? You know, in, researchers are essentially like little entrepreneurs publishing their papers, holding out their wares, with whatever. Whereas if you think about like the research priorities of th people like DeepMind or Microsoft or Fair. Um, I'm sorry, Facebook AI. Um, it's like, okay, why are they doing certain things? Um, there are actually like, it gets into like really kind of subtle questions around like, uh, like industrial organization, market power, like how the structure of these incentives, national, like national AI strategies. Mm -hmm. And it's like really, really like interesting why they commit like certain kinds of resources in certain ways uh, and how they then like, you know, how these executives then structure incentives within the organization around like, and I would say, like, it's certainly in AI and ML, like, a huge proportion of research is done by these industries, right? Um, and I would suspect that, you know, in an emerging, like, let's say for Web3, which is what you guys are focusing on, uh, I guess, like, us too, I suppose, um, you know, a lot of it could potentially be, like, very industry-based. And you think, what are the incentives of these, like, large organizations and making these commitments? What are their, like, 10-year strategies? What is the market sort of, like, structure of these systems that, like, drive these decisions? Yeah. It becomes, yeah, it, Maybe I should take it back. It's going to get super complicated no matter what you do, whether you work in academia or outside of it. For sure. Yeah. I know from our perspective, just looking at, say, the industry side, and one of the roles that Scurf particularly wants to play, and before working at Smart Contract Research Forum, I, I worked here at Carnegie Mellon uh, supporting some of the research initiatives in Scilab and kind of transitioning from trying to convince Web3 organizations to like come invest in CMU and now like working in the industry, I'm like, okay, wow, I, I much better understand why the gap is so big between knowing how to work with uh, academia, especially in this nascent space. And yeah, it is just fascinating to think about what are the kind of culture change slash community building slash consortia building kind of models that might be necessary to even get groups on the same page to understand how to most effectively work with uh, academia in the first place. And I know we're, we're currently collaborating on a project uh, exploring how to particularly assist that around governance. But yeah, it's not straightforward. I know uh, I, I won't call them out specifically, <laughs> uh, but I know at least a few organizations that have come on campus and are like, hey, we're now at the center of your universe because we've rained enough money on you. And it's like, sure, but you know that there's literally 100 other companies with just as much money as you. How do you think this is going to play out? Well, when you're all about community and incentives as an industry and you don't see how you're ruining both by kind of creating that kind of model. Um, so yeah, I just still think that Web3 definitely, the, as an industry, needs a lot more uh, maturity and hand-holding to be uh, um, more adult, so to say, about how to interact with academia. But I know we're coming up on time, so I just figured just to wrap up, uh, in case there are any other things on your mind that, just given this conversation, what else you'd want to mention, if you're aware of any other researchers or, or efforts that you just want to plug, uh, yeah, just kind of uh, any concluding thoughts on the matter before we officially close. Yeah, um, so I've, I've read a few papers on Web3 intersection peer review, and at least one thought when reading it is, I think there's, there are potentially useful things and then there are other things which 
they say they solve, but which have been solved. Um, Sounds they, very appropriate for Web3. Yeah, um, maybe just uh, some, someone somewhere, maybe just separate out the hype from substance will be useful for for other researchers like us. I'm, I'm not really in the Web3 space, but you know, I want to look at this intersection. Hey, what's the key problems that Web3 can solve, yeah. which we don't know how to solve otherwise? Um, that'll be very useful. Yeah, I was just say like one of the things we're trying to do right now is start this, create this like large industry-wide document around like open problems in Web3 governance or DAO governance. Um, and you know, I was just having a conversation with uh, the folks behind uh, Climate Change AI, which is um, a group of folks that you know published a very similar document around like this interdisciplinary effort to apply ML to uh, sort of problems in climate change. And uh, you know, they were just saying that one of the things that they really had to do, kind of very early on, or continue to have to do, or the main activities, is just like cutting through the crap because there's so much hype in these spaces where people make lots of promises that are like not really substantiated. And part of what they do is just go through and just say like, these are the basics of what climate change is. This is the basics of what machine learning is. And just do that like minimal, minimal level of education to say like, this is what actually is going on inside the discipline. And that's such a key service, I think, in trying to define these kinds of scientific disciplines and support them. Absolutely, and especially building to, to Nihar's last point, I just want to mention two projects of Answer Review, which I think is a, has done some really interesting research, and to my knowledge, they were the first to have a peer-reviewed paper on how to improve peer review on a blockchain, specifically using zero-knowledge proofs and some other elements uh, for privacy preservation, uh, and the Decentralized.Science crew uh, that has been plugging away at this for a few years and uh, is very happy to tell everyone all the problems that they've found in the last few years and why Web3 is not just gonna magically solve peer review. Uh, so I, I just feel like those are two of the more grounded projects that we've come across. So I wanted to just uh, plug them in this opportunity. But yeah, thank you all for taking the time to join and thank you both Josh and Nihar for uh, contributing to the conversation today. Thank, Thank you, you for leading it. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah.